Let's start out with a little Hail Mary in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before I start, does anyone have a question? I know you guys never have questions, but I'll ask it anyway. Maybe you could surprise me. Guess not. All right. Is that a question or you're stretching? Well, All right. Well, think about it. Get back to me later. I'll be here for 30 minutes at least. So, uh, you're preparing to receive the sacrament of confirmation. Now, I know um, as I reflect back on my, uh, we, we could call it a conversion story or a deepening of the faith story, whatever, but let's just say when I was 12, I was not that devout, to say the least. And uh, if you told me I was going to be a priest, I would have said, you're out of your mind. So, because I was planning on being a, a fighter pilot at the time, or a state trooper like my brother. My brother was a big influence on me. But in any event, um, just to define a little bit about the sacrament of confirmation. So when you are baptized, the priest or deacon pours the water on your forehead and says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? What happens there? To baptize means to initiate you into the family of God, into a relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you receive a permanent mark on your soul uh, of the Holy Trinity. You know, some people have like a, uh, well, I hate to use this analogy, but like a tattoo on their skin, they have a mark. Well, you have a giant mark on the face of your soul of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, showing that you are connected to the Holy Trinity, and um, the death of Christ on the cross has now been united to your soul, giving you certain benefits. Grace. Who knows what grace is? Besides a girl's name. Anybody? Yes? I know what grace is. What? I know what grace is. Tell us. Grace is given by God to help us each other. Okay. I know there's faith kind of grace and also sacramental grace. What was the second one? Sacramental grace. Okay. The sanctifying grace is what you need to get into heaven. That's what's given to you in baptism. And if you commit a mortal sin and go to confession, it gets restored to you. Sanctifying grace. Don't leave this world without it because you won't get into heaven. Okay. So what is sanctifying grace? It is basically God's life within your soul. You know how you have, you have to have your heart beating and you have to be breathing for your body to be alive? Well, you have to have God's grace in your soul for your soul to be alive. And so when you die, your soul has grace. Your soul goes to be with God in heaven. If it doesn't, well, you go somewhere else. Not so good. So the, gra the grace of God is God's life, his truth, and his love within your soul giving your soul light and life. So at baptism, you receive that life of God in your soul. It gives forgiveness of all sins, original sin, the sin of Adam and Eve, as well as any actual sins you may have committed. Now, if you're baptized as a baby, you haven't had a chance to do much at that point, so it's mainly about original sin. So it puts grace in your soul, gives you forgiveness, and it brings the peace of God into you with a relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So, confirmation is related to baptism because it builds on that sacrament. So, confirmation um, basically takes the, uh, we'll call it a channel, uh, that you already established with the Holy Spirit and it deepens it, makes it more powerful. Think of the difference between a creek and a giant river. So at baptism, you have sort of a creek flowing with the grace of the Holy Spirit in the water. And then at confirmation, a giant river is flowing of God's grace, God's truth, and God's love within your soul. So what happens? You come forward with the name that you pick. Now, I had my dad suggested to me um, 
a uh, uh, Saint Michael the Archangel. And I said, what does he do? And he said, he fights the devil and he kills the devil. And I said, oh, that's cool. I want that. I could probably use that because I knew I wasn't such a good kid. So um, when I was confirmed, I was confirmed with the name Saint Michael. So they said, Saint Michael, you know, or, or be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the, and the bishop takes his thumb with the holy chrism oil blessed during Holy Week and he makes a sign of the cross on your forehead. Be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when you are sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, it's deepening your connection to the Holy Spirit that was begun at baptism. So the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is God. He comes to dwell within you and he helps give you consolation spiritually. He helps enlighten you with the truth of God. He's also called the Spirit of Truth. Um, and so, so I can give witness to that because it was really after I was confirmed that I got more interested in God. And I began to have my little moments of uh, thinking about God where I had that moment where I was, I was uh, climbing a tree in the backyard and I was looking up at the sunset. And the sunset was so impressive with the colors and the rays uh, from above. It was so incredibly beautiful. I thought, wow, there's no way that's an accident. There has to be a God. God has to be there. And so that, that's kind of what we call in philosophy the logic from design. Uh, so the design of the world, the complexity, there's, there's, if you use common sense, there's no way the incredible uh, universe that we live in, you know, with all the different things found in nature, even ourselves, there's no way that uh, that could have happened by accident. I mean, the idea that just, you know, if you have a box and there's nothing in it, and you come back to it a year later, and no one puts anything in it, is there going to be anything in it? No. Well, the universe is like that box. Somebody put what's in the universe in there, and that's God. So God is the uncaused cause, the unmoved mover, um, the... Um, the divine watchmaker, sometimes people use that analogy, if you found a watch on a beach, would you think that the, the watch just happened, you know, by sand coming together and the waves? No way, it had to be uh, put together by somebody. So, so that helped me out a lot. And my dad gave me a Bible for Christmas, which I started to read. And then this summer he gave me a miraculous medal. Now I have these medals for you. I just put them on the altar in the church and blessed them in front of the Blessed Sacrament. So they're all blessed. And the Blessed Mother appeared in 1830 to St. Catherine Labore and promised that all who would wear this medal would receive great graces. You just wear it around the neck. And so I, I wasn't aware of that. I just wore the medal and I remember holding the medal in my hand and asking God to show me a way to get closer to him. And that's when I picked up the rosary. Now I'm giving you guys these little mini finger rosaries. Just one decade of the rosary in a circle. It's easy to carry in your pocket. They've been blessed. They're in the bucket with the miraculous medals. So I started to pray the rosary. It was in August of 1977. I don't think you guys were born yet, except for maybe Roberto over there. No, I don't know. Were you around in 77? 73. 73, there you go, all right. So I think I was 10 years old. So, um, so that was a big year for me. I got the Bible, the miraculous medal, and the rosary, and I started to pray every day. And so the thing about the rosary is the Blessed Mother prays for you and with you. And so when I began to ask for things and they started to happen, they couldn't be explained away by coincidence. That's when I realized I really had something great in the rosary. I said, wow, I have a connection to heaven. This is linking me to God. I am asking for things. God is hearing me and he's answering. Stuff is happening in school, at home, a different like, uh, wow, I'm asking for it and it's happening. So I encourage you to talk to God in your prayer and ask for something. Ask God to help you with a problem maybe you're dealing with. You might be surprised at what might happen. And um, to that I have the other, one of my other uh, arguments for the existence of God. I talked about the ones for the unmoved mover, the philosophical ones. But on a spiritual level, I think God answering our prayers is a powerful proof for the existence of God. But you got to give him a chance. You got to talk to him. Now, another proof for the existence of God is what I call the Saint Anthony of Padua proof for the existence of God. What does that mean? Well, you know we have a statue of Saint Anthony uh, uh, underneath the statue of Saint Joseph in the church. 
So St. Anthony's there because he has been so powerful when I have asked for things over the years. He answers, he's like lightning. All you gotta do is say, St. Anthony, pray for us. I recommend you say it three times. And uh, usually he's like in the lost and found department, but he can help in other things as well. But I remember I had lost um, my rosary and I had a little box. I mean, we're talking three by two inches and one inch deep. And I checked the box three times. I kept checking the box. I know I put my rosary in. I'm looking all around and I, I prayed to St. Anthony, where's my rosary? And I'm looking all around. And I said, well, let me just check the box one more time, a fourth time. There's the rosary. And I'm like, no way. No way. He came down from heaven and put it there. And they're up there laughing right now. I was just like, I, so I was amazed. But a lot of times St. Anthony has come to the rescue. So I encourage you to remember those words saying, Anthony, pray for us. Now, um, the thing about the rosary is that you have the highest saint in heaven, the Blessed Virgin Mary, praying for you and with you. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and she prays for you now at that moment and at the hour of our death. And so um, over the years of prayers, you know, praying the rosary every day, that's what helped me get into the priesthood. Because when I was 16, I started to think about being a priest, and I thought, no, no, no that's, that's not cool. I want to be cool. I want to, I want to fly a plane at supersonic speed. I want, to have a, I want to have a highway patrol car racing down the road with a gun on my hip. That's cool. Priest said, it's not cool. Well, eventually I had a change of heart, and I started to realize that priesthood's beyond cool. Being able to walk the earth and represent Jesus, to do what he did, to bring the word of God to people, to change their lives and get them to heaven. I mean... You know, a fighter plane can fight off the, the bad country and protect the country. You know, a state trooper can d defend you physically. But spiritual rescue, spiritual defense is a whole nother level because it's eternal. So, you know, Superman and Iron Man, they're not real. But what do they do? They save the body. But Jesus saves the soul. The soul is eternal. The body is not. And so an eternal rescue, that is something that makes a difference in people's lives. So, so bringing the word of God to people, bringing the sacrament of the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ to people. And so I encourage you all to, to consider um, reading the word of God, the Bible, especially the Gospels. That's where you want to start. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the Acts of the Apostles. You could open up your Bible, just read a little bit every day. Now the Bible's interesting, um, there's some interesting videos on YouTube. I was watching one on Sodom and Gomorrah, and um, you can actually see the cities there that were destroyed by fire from heaven. And so it says in the book of Genesis that God rained down sulfurous fire and brimstone from heaven to destroy the wicked cities. So you can go there, the guy in the video, he's there, he goes there with his car, and you can see giant buildings covered with ash. And there's these little rocks all over the place. They're sulfur rocks. And this is the only place in the world where the sulfur in the rock is 98% pure sulfur. If you go to uh, other sulfur rocks that are usually near a volcano, there's no volcano there, not anywhere. But if you go to other places, they got 40% sulfur, something like that. But this is 98% pure sulfur. And there's bodies that they found. They found the bones, and the bones are, you can tell the bones have been burned and damaged from the fire. So God punished these cities for their wickedness. Also, um, the uh, crossing of the Red Sea by uh, the, um, the Hebrews running from the Egyptian army. There's one spot where you can cross, it goes down like a boat ramp under the water and comes back up. All the rest is like a cliff. So if you took the water away, you couldn't go off the edge because you'd be dropping like 100 feet to your death. There's one spot that goes down under the water and the divers have found um, chariot wheels from Egyptian chariots. They found skeletons and horses uh, and, and soldiers and swords and armor from the Egyptian army at the bottom of, of the sea. So that's where God caused the water to flow back over them and the Hebrews crossed to the other side to go to the promised land. So there's some interesting things going on in biblical archaeology. Now, as far as the Eucharist goes, there was a priest uh, centuries ago who had doubts about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And 
So after he said the words, this is my body, because that's when the bread and uh, bread is turned into the body of Christ, when the priest says, this is my body. Sometimes I ask people, when does the bread and the wine change in the body and blood of Christ? And they're like, well, when you bless it. Well, yeah, I bless it at the, at the epiclesis when I call down the Holy Spirit, but the consecration is more than a blessing. A blessing dedicates a person, place, or thing to the service of God. A consecration involves changing. So the word con, meaning with. So con, uh, consecration. So the bread is then connected to God. It's consecrated, and, and the priest says the words of Jesus, and Jesus works the miracle, taking the bread, when the priest says, this is my body. And then the priest raises it up, and you hear the bell ring. The bell is an audible signal that God has now come to the altar. And so it says in Luke 24, they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. So we need to recognize Christ in the breaking of the bread at Mass. Jesus says, I am the living bread come down from heaven in John chapter 6. So that's the chapter you should really read to understand the Mass better. John chapter 6, beautiful chapter. And Jesus repeats himself many times. And so that's significant. I am the living bread. I am the bread of life. So uh, when you go to Mass, you need to understand and believe and know that that bread, when you come forward and the priest says the body of Christ, and you say what? Amen. What does it mean? I believe. So you are saying, when the priest says, this is the body of Christ, you're saying, I believe, meaning I believe that's the body of Christ. And so he puts it on your tongue, and you receive the body of Christ, and you, and you go ahead and, and um, uh, um, eat and consume, and then the body of Christ becomes one with your body. The blood of Christ, one with your blood. The, the Holy Spirit, the soul of Christ, is one with your soul. The divine family of God is now united to the human family. So you are becoming one with Christ so that on the day of judgment you are spared. You will receive a resurrected body and your soul receives an increase in sanctifying grace, sacramental graces. So whenever you go to confession, when you go to communion, you receive an increase in the grace, you receive the baptism and also the grace you're going to receive soon at confirmation. So all these graces are designed to help you in your relationship with God. But you have to use your free will. Now, as you go along the road of life, there's going to be people, places, things, and thoughts that come along and try to give you doubts about the truth of God, the truth of the Eucharist, the truth of the Catholic faith. And, you know, I'm here to help you deal with those doubts. All you got to do is come and ask me questions. I, you know, I'm a priest almost 30 years, and before that I studied for many years, and I probably heard all the arguments against the Catholic faith, and I should be able to help you deal with that. But if you don't come and ask me or do some research online, I can't help you. Another thing that's very helpful is uh, knowledge of the um, Shroud of Turin and its miraculous qualities and the Cloth of Guadalupe. Those are two very powerful things as well. Now getting back to the Eucharist, this priest was doing the consecration um, in Lanciano, I don't know if I'm saying it right, in Italy, and he saw the bread turn into actual flesh, and the wine turned into uh, drops of blood, and so it was preserved for centuries. So keep in mind, this is about 800 some years ago. So. Um, in modern times, they took the flesh and the blood to a lab, and they didn't tell them anything. They said, you tell us what qualities you find about this. So the first thing they found was the flesh and the blood were not decaying, they weren't, which they couldn't figure out. Because, you know, once you cut some flesh off someone, it's, you know, it's going to be gone. The other thing is the type of flesh comes from the interior wall of the heart. So you know how we have the images of the Sacred Heart of Jesus reminding us of his love for us? Well, this is actual cut from the heart and the center of the heart, which is kind of amazing. It also didn't have any DNA. So that's another thing. And the blood type, which I think was AB, uh, anyway, it matches the blood type on the Shroud of Turin. Uh, there were some other things they found, but you know I'm up here without notes, so I'm kind of shooting from the hip. But I encourage you to look up that, that uh, miracle, the miracle of Lanciano. And you got that spelling? 
L-A-N-C-I-A-N-O. L -A -N -C -I -A -N -O. If that's not exact, it's close. So you can look, type in Miracle Lanciano uh, online. Um, so that should help you, I think, with your faith. So it's important to remember when you come into church, you're coming into the presence of Christ. Jesus is there. Talk to him. You're going into the house of God. And as Jesus says, I am the living bread come down from heaven. This is my flesh. This is my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant. So it's important for you to recognize when you're in the presence of Christ. Now, the Shroud of Turin, um, they attempted to debunk that a while ago. It made, they, they took a piece of the shroud and they tested it with carbon dating. Unfortunately, the part that they used was damaged in the fire. And so the date came back to the date of the fire. And they're like, well, then the shroud's got to be a forgery. You know, but I mean, it's going back to the date of the fire, but it was in existence before that. So they had a little problem there. So, so um, the thing is, the shroud has unusual qualities. First of all, the image, they, they can't make one. They can't make a new shroud. So the image is formed and the body is weightless. So it's, an, it's a sort of photograph of the resurrection of Jesus. So the shroud is wrapped around the body. It's a 3D image formed in a weightless state. So Jesus is coming back and he, and as his soul returned to his body, it burns into this cloth, the Shroud of Turin, the image of his face and his body. And they can see all the horrible wounds on the back. They estimate, a normal lashing is 40 lashes. Jesus had over three times that amount of lashes on his back, the scourging at the pillar of the second sorrowful mystery. And so they could see the, the third star from is the crowning of thorns. You could see all the, the damage. And I have, if you look at the stairs going up to the choir on the right, I have a, a photographic, uh, like a cloth reproduction of the Shroud of Turin. And it's hard to see, it's kind of faint. But when they took a picture of the face of Jesus and the photographer saw the negative, then all the features of the face of Jesus came out. And I have a, a giant on the left as you're going up the steps, a giant image of the face of Christ from the Shroud of Turin. So um, there are a lot of interesting qualities uh, uh, um, of the Shroud of Turin. The pollen that's on there goes back to Palestine and it would be in the right spot where Jesus was crucified. Then of course the <coughs> another one which is sort of like the companion is the cloth of Guadalupe. Again, they cannot make another one. It's not a painting. They don't know what the image is. They can't duplicate it. And it's sort of alive. It maintains 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So the cloth of Guadalupe has the same temperature as a living human body. And the colors seem to change when they look at it. The communists try to destroy it uh, because it's an object of faith, just like they attacked it in Rome. They attacked the Shroud of Turin, tried to burn the church down. Um, uh, I think, I can't remember if the fire was in the 60s or 70s, but because it was an object of faith and the people that don't believe were attacking it, you know, and your faith, you know, is something that you need to work on. So all of you right here are at different levels of faith. But the thing is, you need to be open to God. If you want to be a skeptic, you can turn around and say, ah, that's a coincidence. Ah, I don't believe that. Ah, that's nonsense. You know, you can be a skeptic and discount all the things I'm saying and all the evidence that we can give you about the faith and you can weaken your faith or even lose your faith if you want to do that. Because your free will works with your faith. Or you can say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give God a chance in my life and you're going to pray to him, ask him to help you. You can say to God, I'm struggling with my faith. Help my faith grow. Pray about it. Speak to the Lord. He loves you. He created you. He died on the cross for you. He wants you to be with him forever in heaven. And so this world is a place of testing. Unfortunately, we're being tested. And so we're also training in the love of God and neighbor that we may reign with God. And so we're working as well in the vineyard. So uh, we work for God. So we, we test, we train, and we labor in the service of God. Why did God make me? The old, old catechism answer to know him and love him and serve him in this world and be happy forever with him in the next. So everybody wants to be happy. Now you may have figured out already, there's nothing in this world that's going to give you perfect happiness. You could have the best chocolate ice cream, the best pizza, you could have the fastest, coolest car, the prettiest girlfriend or the toughest boyfriend or whatever you want, the greatest house on the beach, 
And it's still not perfect happiness because we were made by an infinite God and only the infinite God can satisfy us. The finite things of this world are limited. St. Augustine says, Our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in you. And Psalm 62, In God alone is my soul at rest. So, uh, pleasures of the senses, as good as they may be, they're never going to give you happiness. The things of this world, never going to give you happiness. Plus, it's temporary. We all know we're going to the next world. It's only a matter of time. We all hope it's later rather than sooner, but you never know. Right now that war is going on in the Ukraine and Putin's talking about threatening using nuclear weapons. So who knows, you know? Um, he's got those hypersonic missiles that travel at 10 times plus the speed of sound and they can get here pretty quick. So we never know when the moment's gonna come we're going from this world to the next. And that's why Jesus says, be ready at all times to stand before the Son of Man, for you know not the day nor the hour. And so, um, again, this world is temporary. Another sign that you can't have happiness if you know it's going to end. So we want happiness that is complete, perfect, never ending. We want to be with our friends and our family and God forever, lacking nothing. That's heaven. That's where we're hoping to go. But before you get there, you need to pray. You need to keep the commandments. You need to receive the sacraments frequently and worthily. You need to struggle for God. Sacrificial love, where you give something up. You give, uh, give up time for prayer. You give up the things of this world for the things of the next world. And you, and you grow in your relationship with God. Because on the day that you die, on the day that you go in front of God, you don't want to meet a stranger. You want to meet the God that you've been praying to your whole life especially in the rosary. And so I encourage you to pray at least a decade a day. I have my little saying, a decade a day keeps the devil away. And in fact, this little rosary here that I'll be giving you soon is a decade, okay? So you can keep this in your pocket and just pray the Our Father and the Ten Hail Marys and meditate on one of the mysteries. So uh, I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting to the end of my time here, I think. So uh, any questions? You guys know what confirmation is? It's going to make you a soldier and a salesman for Christ. It's going to make you a soldier because it will give you strength to fight for the faith under persecution and temptation. And it's going to make you a salesman because you're going to do better at witnessing to others about the faith. That's what we're called to do. We're not called just to keep the faith to ourselves. We're called to give it away, to spread it to others by what we say and do. So confirmation will help you uh, strengthen you and your ability to be a soldier for Christ and a salesman for Christ. So um, with that, I will uh, end with a little blessing. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.